Transmission Line Parameters. In the last video, we derived our transmission line equations, our wave equations for voltage and current, and we solved those. And we did all this in terms of the fundamental parameters R, L, G, and C. Here what we'd like to do is derive the more meaningful parameters like attenuation coefficient, phase constant, impedance. And once we do all that, we'll have the general equations for general transmission lines. We'll look at some special cases then like lossless, weakly absorbing, distortionless. And we'll end with a discussion of why we use 50 ohms for a standard impedance for transmission lines. We had a similar discussion when we were talking about electromagnetic waves. We had the permeability, permittivity, and conductivity, and we said that those are fundamental to Maxwell's equations, but given the numbers here, we can't really look at those and interpret anything meaningful about what it does to a wave. So instead, we calculated these more intuitive parameters like refractive index, impedance, attenuation coefficient, phase constant, loss tangent, and there were others. A similar thing is happening here. The fundamental parameters are R, L, G, and C. However, if we were given numbers here, a similar thing happens. We can't look at those and really interpret anything intuitive about how it affects signals on the transmission line. So instead, we need these meaningful parameters like the impedance of the line, the attenuation coefficient, phase constant, voltage standing wave ratio, which is something we'll talk about, and others. So that's the purpose of this lecture, to derive those other parameters. Attenuation coefficient and phase constant. So when we were deriving the wave equation for transmission lines, we defined this complex propagation constant gamma, which we knew was the attenuation coefficient plus J times the phase constant. And this expression with our fundamental parameters fell out of the derivation for the wave equation. Now what we'll do to get rid of the square root is square both sides of this equation. So we end up with an alpha plus J beta squared, and then we got rid of the square root on the right. At this point, we can multiply everything out, and we have an expanded expression. Then what we'll do is collect real and imaginary parts on both sides of the equation. So on the left, we have something that's purely real plus J times a bunch of constants. Then we have a real part and an imaginary part on the right. So this is the equation that we ended with on the previous slide. Now what we'll do is we'll set the real part on the left equal to the real part on the right and the imaginary part on the left equal to the imaginary part on the right. So if we set the real parts equal, we get one equation. If we set the imaginary parts equal, we get a second equation. So we can, now we're coming away with two equations, which is good because we have two unknowns, alpha and beta, two equations, two unknowns. Let's proceed with those. What we're going to do now is derive a quadratic equation for alpha squared. So the quadratic equation will not be for alpha, it will be for alpha squared. So this is our starting point, our two equations from the previous slide. What we'll do first is take this first equation and solve for beta. We can then plug that expression into our second equation to get one equation entirely in terms of alpha. All right, so the first thing was solve that first equation for beta. Then we substitute this expression for beta into our second equation. And now we can multiply all of that out and we can rearrange terms and we end up with a quadratic equation in terms of alpha squared. So again, I'll mention it's not in a quadratic equation in terms of alpha, it's a quadratic equation in terms of alpha squared. That's why we have an alpha to the fourth here and an alpha squared here and no alpha multiplying that term. So we then determine alpha squared using the quadratic equation. And just to remind us what the quadratic equation is, if we have an ax squared plus bx plus c, we can calculate our value of x. 
The only issue here really is that we have this sign ambiguity on the square root that we'll have to give some thought to. So we can put our quadratic equation in terms of alpha squared in the form of a quadratic equation with these substitutions. Our a equals 1. Our b is omega squared lc minus rg. We get that. That's what's multiplying alpha squared. And so this last term then is c. And our equation, instead of being in terms of x, is in terms of alpha squared. So we can use those expressions for a, b, c, and x to then plug them into our quadratic formula and solve for alpha squared. And so that's exactly what we do. The only thing we have to do now is figure out what to do with this sign. So this is where we were on the last slide. And let's think about alpha. Alpha has to be a purely real number, right? And right now we have an alpha squared. So in order for alpha to be purely real, when we take the square root of this eventually, this expression cannot be negative. And really the only way to ensure that is to make this positive. So that's how we resolve the sign on that square root. We make sure it's positive, and then that means alpha will be a purely real number. So we go away with just the positive. And that is our expression for alpha squared. We're not done with that because we still have to yet take the square root of it. But for now, we're done with alpha. We're going to move on to beta. Remember our second equation. This is when we first had one single equation after we squared that equation for gamma. We set real part equal to real part, imaginary equal to imaginary, and we had this second equation. Well, we now have an expression for alpha squared. We can plug that in here, and then we'll have an expression for beta squared. So there's our expression from the previous slide for alpha squared. And if we throw that in, here's where we end up. And of course, we can rearrange terms to have an expression for beta squared. And the only difference between these two equations is the sign on the square root. And that's interesting. So we have an expression for alpha squared, beta squared. Really what we want is alpha and beta. So we take the square root of those. But now we have another sign to resolve. What do we do now? Well, we're going to take the positive root because for passive materials, alpha and beta are both positive numbers. So we go with the positive root. And we end up with our final expressions for alpha and beta in terms of the fundamental parameters, R, L, G, and C. And what we can see is this is a strange mix of R, L, G, and C, and that's why given values of R, L, G, and C, it's not real intuitive of how that affects signals on the line. But alpha and beta do give us how these signals are affected on the line. All of the loss information is consolidated into alpha, and all of the speed and oscillation information is consolidated into beta, even though that wasn't apparent in R, L, G, and C. On to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. So we start off with our basic definition of characteristic impedance, which is voltage divided by current. So we can go with our forward waves. We have the amplitude, the voltage amplitude of the forward wave divided by the current amplitude of the forward wave. And we can also define it in terms of the backward wave. Voltage amplitude of the backward wave divided by the voltage current amplitude of the backward wave. Notice there's a negative sign here. That also came up when we were talking about plane waves and we had a backward wave and there was a handedness change. Now it has to do with the phase relation between V and I for the backward wave. It turns out that the characteristic impedance of lines always seems to sort of fall in the general range of 50 to 100 ohms. I think it's interesting that it always seems to fall around there. 
The other thing is that the actual impedance is not of that much importance. What is important is when the impedance changes on the line because that causes scattering and reflections. Normally we don't want that, other times we do. So let's go ahead and derive the characteristic impedance. And this is a little bit of a long story. So we start with our telegrapher equations. These are the equivalent of Maxwell's curl equations, if you recall. But we have expressions. We solve for the voltage and the current. We can take those expressions and substitute them back into our telegrapher equations. When we do, we end up here. Well, the next thing to do then is to bring the derivative on the inside and take the derivatives. So these are our equations from the previous slide. Let's go ahead and calculate these derivatives. When we do that, we end up here. So we did several things at this point. We took the derivative on these first lines, and so the, the plus or minus gamma has come to the outside on both terms and for both equations. The other thing we did in the bottom is multiply out this expression and then collect terms so that we have an R plus J omega L multiplying this first term and then an R plus J omega L multiplying the second term. And we did the same thing over here. So we'll have a G multiplying this first term and a J omega C multiplying the second term. And we end up here. So we come away with two equations. These are those two equations from the previous slide. Now, if we look at both sides, we see that we have these negative exponentials and positive exponentials. And the negative exponentials is talking about a forward wave. The, back, the positive exponentials are talking about a backward wave. Our forward and backward waves are independent. So that means we can take this term multiplying our negative exponential and set it equal to this expression multiplying the negative exponential on the right. So we can come away with a new equation. Then we can also set whatever is multiplying our positive exponential on the left equal to whatever is multiplying the positive exponential on the right. So this first equation has split into two equations. We can go to our second equation and do the exact same thing and extract two equations from it. So we went from two equations now to four equations. Here are our four equations. Now remember what our original definition was of impedance. It was V over I. Well, each of these four equations is very easy to rearrange for that. Let's look at this first one. We can take this gamma term, bring it over to the right. Then we can take this current term and bring it over to the left, and we will be left with a V naught over I. And we can make that similar argument for the other three equations. So if we do that, we end up with four different expressions for characteristic impedance. However, of course, these two are the same and these two are the same. Either one will give us the correct answer for characteristic impedance. Ultimately, we don't want gamma in our expression for characteristic impedance. We want to calculate that just from our fundamental parameters, R, L, G, and C. So we have to go back and remember what our definition was for gamma and then substitute that into our expressions for characteristic impedance. This is where we were from the previous slide. We derived this R plus J omega L over gamma twice and then gamma over J omega C twice. And we can go with either one of these. It'll give us the same answer. So let's proceed with this first equation and plug in this expression for gamma down here. So we proceed with the first equation and we plug in our expression for gamma. Well, this will simplify down because look, we have an R plus J omega L here and there's another one here. And so through some very simple algebra, we bring the R J omega L into the square root, and now we see that one of these will cancel with this R plus J omega L. And we end up with our final equation for the characteristic impedance in terms of R, L, G, and C. Those are our fundamental parameters.
So sort of as a summary of what we've done, we started off with a definition of characteristic impedance. Then we manipulated our transmission line equations and, and all that. We ended up with two equations that we could derive our characteristic impedance from. And when we plugged in our expression for the complex propagation constant, we ended up here. And this equation is our final equation for characteristic impedance in terms of R, L, G, and C. Let's dissect the characteristic impedance to try to understand a little bit better. I think it is most meaningful to think of the characteristic impedance in polar coordinates. It is a complex number because it's relating amplitude and phase between the voltage and current. So in polar coordinates, we have a magnitude of our characteristic impedance, and then we have the angle or the phase of the characteristic impedance. So what we'll do is we'll start off and just define our voltage signal as some amplitude times the oscillating exponential term. And so far, we've been doing the same thing with the current. It has some amplitude times this oscillating exponential term. But now that we're armed with the impedance, we can say, well, the amplitude of the current wave really is the amplitude of the voltage wave divided by this complex impedance. Even more meaningful then is to substitute in the polar form, and we end up with the voltage divided by the magnitude of impedance, and then the angle information comes up here into a complex exponential. So the angle part affects the phase between V and I, and the magnitude affects the amplitude. So impedance is still a balance. We used to describe this, the impedance of a material as the balance between E and H. Now impedance is a balance between voltage and current. So it's kind of like we have a transmission line, we push on it with an oscillating voltage that has some amplitude and phase, and that transmission line responds with a current of some different amplitude and some different phase, and we quantify that difference through the impedance. Well, the characteristic impedance can also be written in a rectangular form where you have a, a resistive term and a reactive term. So the resistive part, it's important to understand that even though that's an R, it's not equal to our distributed parameters R or G. It's a mix of those. And also L and C mix in to give the real part of impedance as well. And likewise, the reactive part is not J omega L or one over J omega C or L and C were those fundamental parameters. It's a mix of everything that fell into that. But it's rare we'll use that interpretation of impedance anyway. The polar form is much more common and I think much more useful and insightful. Now let's talk about special cases of transmission lines. So the first one really isn't a special case. It's the general transmission line and it's everything that we've just discussed. So summarized in, in one place, let's write down all of our equations. We first had the propagation constant. Remember that fell out when we were deriving the wave equation for transmission lines. We then went through a series of steps and we derived the attenuation coefficient as a function of the fundamental parameters R, L, G, and C. And this is where all of the loss information collects. We had a phase constant, which is really the same equation other than there's a sign difference here. And all the information about speed and oscillation and wavelength all collect into this term. And then finally, we have our characteristic impedance. And so our final equation in terms of R, L, G, and C was that. Now on to lossless lines. The value of a lossless line is when I'm thinking about a problem very quickly in my head, I'm usually thinking of the equations associated with a lossless line. And I understand that's not exact, but the equations are much simpler. And normally we can get very close when we're doing quick calculations. So for a lossless line, both R and G are equal zero. This means there is no resistance along the direction of the conductor. We have a perfect conductor. And the conductance from conductor to conductor is also zero. So whatever is between the conductors is perfectly insulating. So when that happens, our complex propagation constant reduces and simplifies considerably. 
Notice our complex propagation constant only has an imaginary component. There is no real component. That's already telling us that this attenuation term has to be zero. And of course it's zero because we have a lossless line. So attenuation coefficient is zero. Our phase constant is just omega times the square root of LC. This is very similar when we were talking about plane waves. We had our phase constant being omega times the square root of mu times epsilon. And then our characteristic impedance is just the square root of L over C. And so whenever I'm thinking about impedance of a transmission line, this is really the equation that's in my head, not the R plus J omega L over G plus J omega C. I understand that equation exists, but when I'm doing quick calculations in my head, this is what I am thinking. Square root of L over C. So the square root of distributed inductance divided by distributed capacitance. Our next line, a weakly absorbing line. And this is probably the most realistic thing. If we have a transmission line, somebody probably designed it the best they could to get the losses as low as possible. But we live in a, a real world and there always is a little bit of loss. So most transmission lines of interest we can classify as weakly absorbing. Mathematically, if it's weakly absorbing, R is much less than omega L and G is much less than omega C. So in a weakly absorbing line, our attenuation coefficient reduces to this expression. One half R over characteristic impedance plus G times characteristic impedance. Let's think a little bit about what that equation is telling us. First, it's telling us if our transmission line has a very small impedance, since we're dividing by the characteristic impedance, that would make this term the most significant. So in a low impedance transmission line, the resistivity in the conductor is what dominates the attenuation. In contrast, if we have a high impedance transmission line, that makes the second term the dominant term because we're multiplying by the characteristic impedance. So in a high impedance line, the attenuation is dominated by the conductance in the dielectric between the conductors. Now, if we think of these at the same time, what this tells us is that there's a sort of sweet spot when we pick the impedance of a line to try to minimize the attenuation. And we'll see more of that in a little bit. The last special case we'll discuss is the distortionless line. Let's look at our equation for the attenuation. Notice there is an omega term there. That means the attenuation is a function of frequency. So if we launch a signal at one side of our transmission line, that signal has some frequency spectrum associated with it. We would like that frequency spectrum to stay intact and not change at all at the other end of the line. Well, if our attenuation is a function of frequency, then those frequencies will attenuate differently. And at the end of the line, we get a distorted signal. And we don't want that. So how can we avoid that? Well, if we stare at this equation long enough, what we realize is if that R divided by L is equal to G over C. If somehow we can ensure that condition, it turns out omega disappears from our equation of alpha. So for the distortionless line, our complex propagation constant reduces to this, which is rather interesting. So our attenuation coefficient is just square root of R times G. And our phase constant is the equation that we saw for the lossless line, omega times square root of LC. Now, I just wanted to point out here, we made our line distortionless by getting rid of omega up here. Notice there's no omega in the equation for alpha. However, there's an, an omega in our equation for beta. And we might ask, well, doesn't that distort the line? And not really, because we need the omega there, because different frequencies have different wavelength, and therefore the different frequencies have to accumulate different phase if they're traveling through the same length line. 
So we actually need this linear proportion of beta with respect to omega. We don't want that for alpha. And we can see now we have an expression for alpha that does not contain omega. So a difference there to keep in mind. Characteristic impedance. It's square root of L over C again, but we can also calculate as a square root of R over G for the distortionless line because R over G equals L over C for a distortionless line. Interestingly, there's no reactive part to a distortionless line. We'll end this video with a fun discussion of why 50 ohms seems to be our standard for characteristic impedance of transmission lines. If we alter the dimensions of our transmission line, that affects both its impedance and its loss characteristics, its attenuation. So we can do that. We can adjust our B over A parameter. We can tabulate what happens to the attenuation, what happens to the impedance, and then we can create a plot of the attenuation versus the impedance of the line. And we get these curves here for different fills in a coaxial cable. And here's where we see this sweet spot of where the attenuation is lowest as we're tweaking things about our line. So a coax cable that has air as its core seems to have a minimum attenuation, yeah, maybe around 75 ohms or so. Whereas something with a Teflon fill that has a, a dielectric constant around 2.2 has a minimum attenuation of around 50 ohms. So this is a clue of one reason why we're choosing 50 ohms for our impedance, because normally they have a dielectric and we want attenuation to be the smallest. We're also interested in the power handling capability and how impedance affects that. So imagine again, we're tweaking these dimensions of a transmission line and we're looking at the peak voltage and peak current on the line as we're tweaking the dimensions of the line. So if we want a line to handle very high voltage, we need that peak voltage to be as low as possible. And if we want a transmission line to carry as much power as possible, we want the peak current to be as low as possible. So in terms of voltages, what we see is a sweet spot somewhere around 60 ohms. So if we need a line to carry very high voltage, but maybe not so much current, we might choose its characteristic impedance to be 60 ohms for a coax. Well, to handle high current, the peak current seems to be lowest somewhere around 30 ohms. So 30, 60 ohms, again, this 50 ohm seems to be some kind of a trade-off between these two. But the real reason we use 50 ohms, even though we just had some good arguments, it always seems to go back to these two folks working at Bell Labs in the early 1900s. And they were trying to send a radio frequency signal around four megahertz. They wanted to send that hundreds of miles. And so they were concerned about a lot of different things. To send it that far, they wanted to minimize attenuation. They also knew they were going to have to crank a bunch of power through the line, so they wanted to handle high power. And so they did an analysis, and they plotted some data. They plotted a few things. The, the attenuation as a function of the impedance in a coax cable. This is an air-filled coax cable. And they found a sweet spot around 75 ohms. They then plotted its voltage handling capability as a function of impedance, and they found a sweet spot yeah, around 60 ohms. They looked at the power handling capability, so they were looking at the peak current, and they found this sweet spot around 30 ohms. And all this together, they ended up converging to 50 ohms as a good trade-off between all of these different things. But even then, the community really can't say for sure this is why we've decided on 50 ohms. It just seems to have happened, and most everything has a 50 ohm standard. But it does seem to be a pretty good trade-off. So we sort of showed that 50 ohms seems like a trade-off. It's basically ideal for coax lines. However, we use 75 ohms for a standard and coax. Why on earth is this? The ideal seems to be more like 50 ohms. Well, 
we have to think about what it takes to get the 75 ohm. And maybe it's because of this. It would require a thicker center conductor, which would mean it would cost more and it would be less flexible. And so maybe the 50 ohms is a trade-off between all this stuff. Nobody really knows. And so if you find out, I'd love to hear from you.